you ever get the feeling that trucks are taking over our roads? Well, over here, they own the road. That's this week on Motoring 2002. SN's Motoring 2002 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas! This week we're at one of the most famous racetracks in the world, Nürburgring, just outside of Cologne, Germany. And you know, they tell me it's only 10 minutes from the birthplace of Michael and Rolf Schumacher. I'm standing at the legendary carousel. Now, although the German Grand Prix is now being held in Hockenheim, this facility is still used for the European Grand Prix, as well as a form of motor racing that years ago many would have considered almost sacrilegious. It's truck racing, and not only has it become one of the most popular events in Europe, it's a sport that is headed for North America. Eins, zwei, drei, vier. The original track was, was built in the, in the 20s, early 20s and uh, Formula One uh, had been racing here for many, many, many years. Uh, this uh, truck Grand Prix of uh, uh, Germany here at the Nürburgring has a, also a long tradition. Uh, it started about 15 years ago and it's certainly the highlight of the race season here of the European Truck Race Championship. This is in the grassroots racing. They have the, the body of a, of, a, of a truck, but these are uh, uh, serious race cars. And so are the drivers. Uh, I mean, these are not just uh, people who park their truck in front of the racetrack and come in and, uh, and race their racetrack. Uh, these are professional race drivers. The trucks are Super A and Super B class trucks. Only slight differences between the two run groups. They do run together. They have uh, 12 liter displacement engines. Uh, typically the two trucks running in the series right now are MAN and Mercedes-Benz and uh, they're putting out about a thousand horsepower and, or better and running to a top speed of 100 miles an hour that's electronically limited. It's my understanding is even bigger than Formula One. Last year some uh, 240,000 people gathered here for the weekend for this truck racing. So it's great. I'm from Sweden myself. And I, it took me 1,000 kilometers to get here. The transmission which we supply to the series is a spec transmission for all the trucks in the series. It's uh, a ZF automatic transmission for uh, city bus application. And it's taken off the assembly line and modified for the truck series, but it is basically a spec transmission. The transmission actually is programmed to operate like a sequential gearbox. And so the driver has the option of running fully automatic, or he can actually change over to a manual setting that will allow him to move the shift lever forward and back, upshift and downshift uh, in a sequential-like fashion. So as soon as he hits the shifter, the truck will upshift or downshift. Big boys and big toys, this is, isn't it? Um, they don't come bigger than this for racing. Uh, it's a challenge, but also a lot of people that are in involved in the transport industry also come to the race meetings and so it gives sponsors um, an ideal platform for their products. It started out with a standard tractor unit uh, that was a road going vehicle but nowadays we've got like Formula One and um, what you see behind here uh, it's a works engine, it's uh, got a special CAD design chassis unit um, it still looks like a standard Mercedes, Tago, uh, road going truck. But that's about it. Everything else is special. From a rolling start of about 30 kilometers an hour, they'll reach 160K in about three to four seconds. So 
all the trucks are very close, they run road circuits, and the road circuits enable the tr drivers to really excel. You've got uh, braking, you know, turning into corners, diving into corners. They really try and push each other out of the way to get to the front of the pack. So watching 10,000 pound trucks from 100 miles an hour dive into corners and try and pick up positions is pretty exciting racing. People say, why race trucks? But then why race horses? Why race dogs, you know? Why race touring cars? They weren't designed for that. And trucks are a vehicle. You can tell by the people that come to watch them. They're fascinating to watch. That's why so many thousand people come here to the Nürburgring and throughout Europe. And it's just great, you know? It's very exciting. It's the sort of um, the buzz of, of being involved with it because all the people are allowed around the trucks. And I guess a lot of these people here are all involved in the trucking industry, which is massive in Europe. So they get a chance to be attached to it. And it's the fascination factor, I guess, really, and uh, gives me a job. Braking is a crucial point. So that's where the um, losers are separated from the winners, who can break themselves at the very last minute to overtake the other guys. The brakes are water-cooled. Uh, so there are injectors that actually spray water onto the brakes every time they're applied. Uh, if they didn't uh, water cool the brakes, the brakes would overheat uh, to the point where you would lose total braking in about a lap. Nobody really thought about uh, this, this event growing that, that big here and uh, it amazes everybody and, and you see the support from the industry. I mean this is a, a huge marketing platform for everybody um, and it has been growing over the years. I think it would be very good for North America. The, I think plans are afoot to hold a series in 2002. I would like to uh, come over and probably compete in that series. It could be the start of what could be a World Series. I've got one year of racing experience 31 times, but racing a 10,000 pound truck? My thoughts later on Kenzie's Corner. Where are the keys to this thing? Once upon a time, there was a roadster called the SLK. Now, this 120 pound weakling was forever having sand kicked in its grill when it came down to Roadster Beach. Well, that's all about to change because our young pup has bulked up on steroids. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the AMG SLK 32. The SLK comes courtesy of Mercedes-Benz high-performance tuner AMG. Long revered for its work, this small outfit has outdone itself. While most of the add-ons are relatively subtle in nature, the same cannot be said of the engine. It now boasts just over 9 pounds of automobile per horsepower. That's a spine-tingling 349 ponies and 332 pound-speed of torque, all of which blast through to the rear wheels via a slick five-speed automatic. Generally, an automatic in this type of car would be considered passe. Not so with the SLK, however. The new speed shift transmission provides up to 35% faster gear changes than a conventional automatic, and under heavy braking mid-thrash, the box automatically downshifts, selecting the right gear for the situation. You can also slip gears by touching the shifter. Indeed, this setup is good enough that it negates the need for a manual gearbox. The secret to the SLK's performance is this supercharger that sits in the middle of the V. This thing force feeds the engine, delivering enough air to give you 300 pounds feet of torque at barely over 2,000 RPM. Now, unlike a turbocharger, a supercharger is instantaneous in response. A turbo, there's a lag time between request and delivery. This thing, you breathe on the gas pedal and it takes off like a scalded cat. To ensure the requisite control, the SLK32 comes with a tweaked version of the base suspension. The calibration not only kept the car glued during the pylon test, it retains a high degree of long distance comfort. 
Factor in the Mammoth 225-45ZR tyres up front and 245-40 in back, razor sharp steering response and a seemingly endless amount of grip and you have one of the most athletic automobiles offered. To say it's fun is perhaps the ultimate understatement. Without question, the SLK's most endearing trait is this tin top. In winter, provided you put snow tires on, of course, you could drive it quite safely and with the usual warmth of a coupe. However, when summer arrives, you hold a button for about 25 seconds and the whole lot folds back down into the back end of the car. The only drawback, of course, is that there's no trunk space. But to paraphrase a line from that film, quite frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. To ensure the outrageous horsepower remains manageable, the SLK gets a sophisticated electronic stability control system. With it turned on, braking the rear wheels free is next to impossible. However, turn it off and you're in for one entertaining ride. From a standstill, it will light up the tyres and urged on mid-corner, it hangs the back end out as well as anything tested. Simply stated, unless you're lucky enough to have a racetrack in your backyard, leave it switched on. Inside, the steroiding continues where you get a much nicer set of AMG seats. They're noteworthy for their two-tone colour and the amount of lateral support you get in the shoulder area and in the lumbar area. On the centre console, you get Blackbird's Eye Maple. The rest of it is pretty much stock SLK. However, there are a couple of complaints. First of all, not having a CD in a car of this quality is shameful. And these coffee cup holders, well, they won't work in a pedestrian car, never mind one that's been put on a steroid course. Stopping power comes from large disc brakes and a four-channel anti-lock system that includes brake assist. When the system senses a panic stop, it automatically applies full braking effort, shaving upwards of 40% off the driver-only distance. Consequently, the stopping distance from 100k is less than 118 feet. Elsewhere, the SLK comes with rollover hoops, a reinforced windshield header, dual front and side airbags, as well as xenon headlights. You know, you simply cannot condone the use of steroids in athletics. It's cheating after all. However, when it comes to bulking up a car, that's just fine in my book. Indeed, putting 349 horsepower in something that is barely bigger than a roller skate, well, it works just fine for me and places this new Benz at the top of the heap. Let the horsepower wars begin is what I say, because I can hardly wait to see what BMW and Porsche do to respond. As promised by Honda, the Insight is returning phenomenal mileage. A test average to date of over 60 miles to the gallon, or 4.7 litres per 100 kilometres. The secret lies in the manner in which the electric motor is used to assist what would otherwise be a rather underpowered three-cylinder engine. Shifting to neutral and taking your foot off the clutch also saves gas as the engine shuts down. Select first and the engine springs back to life before you need to pull away. The other area that's impressing is the efficiency with which the main battery retains its charge. Using the wasted energy during the braking process or when coasting downhill keeps it topped up so that the electric motor is always ready to work. On our next update we take a look at public acceptance of this rather unusual car. Our Midas Tip of the Week concerns preparing your vehicle's finish for the winter. First step is to do a good hand wash of the vehicle. When you're washing it by hand, you're going to see all the problem spots. You can see the little nicks and scratches, stone chips. There may be areas that you need professionally repaired if rust or damage is extensive. But in many vehicles, it's a simple matter of getting some touch-up paint and just touching up those little nicks that are on the leading edge or door chips that have occurred during the summertime. You won't be able to do this when the ambient gets too low, so get to it in the early part of the fall. Another thing you want to do is apply a good coat of wax to the exterior to help protect that finish. It may not gain you a whole lot right now, but two or three years down the road when everybody else's vehicle looks a little on the dull side, yours will still look nice and bright and shiny. Now next week we'll talk about some of the mechanical items that you want to look at under the hood of your vehicle and around the rest of the vehicle before the winter time. That's your Midas Tip of the Week.
this Austin uh, is a very rare car in North America. In fact, in the world, there was very few of them made. Uh, this is one of maybe uh, 150 surviving. Uh, in North America, I believe there's most probably about 20. The engine is uh, basically the same engine that went into the Austin Healey 104. It's about a 2700cc, twin carburetors, twin SUs, so it's quite powerful and the name uh, Austin A90, that 90 is supposed to uh, give you an indication of the horsepower. It's approximately 90 horsepower, but I just love the streamlined, the way everything flows down to the back and I love cars with lots of chrome on. This car's got lots of chrome. Well, the European truck race is continuing here at the Nürburgring racetrack in Germany. As I mentioned earlier, all these guys are running on straight diesel. In fact, more than half the cars in this country are all diesel powered. Unlike North America, where everybody likes to complain about high gasoline prices and pollution, yet you can't give a diesel vehicle away. But you know, I know one guy who might have some insight into this situation, and that's our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Bill? Well, Brad, uh, in the late 70s and early to mid 80s, you probably remember there were quite a few cars with diesel engines. GM tried the diesel engine option in Oldsmobile, Cutlasses and full-size Oldsmobiles. Cadillac had diesel engines, even in some of their front-wheel drive cars. And there was even a Chevette diesel. Mercedes made lots of diesel engine cars. And one of the main ideas of putting the diesel engine in these vehicles was they were, in many cases, leave out the Chevette, but in most cases they were heavy, non-aerodynamic cars that gave pretty poor fuel mileage with a gasoline engine. So by substituting a diesel, they improved the fuel economy and it appealed to many people. But in terms of today's cars, you've got mid-sized cars getting 35 to 38 miles per gallon. You've got compacts and subcompacts getting 45 to 50 miles per gallon and better in some cases. So the, uh, the push for getting a diesel engine is just not there anymore. The advantages are not as clear cut. One of the very few cars that you'll see on, on the showroom today with a diesel engine is the Volkswagen with the TDI or turbo direct injection engine. I've driven those cars. The performance is pretty good. The drivability is good and the fuel mileage is great. But the feedback that I get from my customers that own them and from other motorists I talk to on the street is that when it comes to repair time, in some cases, they're kind of wishing that they hadn't opted for the diesel engine because repairs on any diesel engine are considerably more expensive than a gas engine. However, there is one market segment where we really need to talk about the diesel engine option, and that's the light trucks. Pickups, vans, sport utilities, cube vans. In most cases, all of these vehicles have at least one diesel engine option. Now, in a half-ton chassis, in most cases, you're better off with just a gas engine. In other words, if, you're, if your truck needs are what we term light duty, a half-ton chassis will do, gas engine is probably your best bet. When you get into three-quarter and one-ton chassis, and certainly into cube vans, or anything that's used for towing a heavy trailer, like a horse trailer or a large travel trailer, you're going to want to think about a diesel engine because there's a huge advantage for the diesel in terms of fuel economy. When these vehicles are heavily loaded, as they typically are, the diesel engine could have a 10 to 12 mile per gallon advantage in fuel economy. The repairs may be more expensive, but over the long haul, you're going to save a lot on fuel. Now, if your truck usage is light duty and short trips, the gas engine is probably still your best bet, especially if your drivers on your vehicle are not with it in terms of the maintenance and, and uh, how to care for a diesel engine. So this is one thing you want to think about if you're a business owner buying a truck for deliveries. Think about the diesel engine and consider your usage. Another thing that I advise my customers, if they've got a one-ton truck and they're using it for heavy loads, in many cases those owners, those business owners are better to move up to what we call a medium duty truck with the larger wheels and tires, a much bigger chassis and a true truck diesel engine. It's got a heavier powertrain. You're probably talking about 10 to 15,000 more in the initial expense of the truck, but over 10 years the repair costs are much lower on those trucks because they just play with the loads. They're not uh, they're not working hard to do the type of usage that uh, many people are into. If you're hauling liquids or heavy loads, that's the way to go. In terms of cars, though, not much choice today other than the Volkswagen TDI. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2002.
On this particular Sunday in July, the best attended motorsport event in the world wasn't the Molson Indy in Toronto. It wasn't even the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. It was the truck race here at the Nürburgring. Almost a quarter of a million people showed up this weekend to watch some of the most unbelievable racing they've ever seen. And why not? You've got 15 super trucks with about 1,600 horsepower each going down the front straight here, about four abreast, and there's barely room for one of them in turn one. Every single race, we had trucks bouncing off each other, sliding through the grass. One event, they had the red flag because about eight guys tried to get into turn one. It looked like the break in a pool game. Unbelievable. Now, the bottom line is the fastest trucks with the best drivers won the race. But in the meantime, there was tremendous action for every position. Now, this event also has a real family atmosphere. It's affordable enough that a family can actually come to a motor race. They can park and camp out on the old Nürburgring and then walk here to the new circuit to watch the races. Some of the fashion statements are a bit unusual. There seems to be a real love affair with the cowboy flavor here. you got a lot of cowboy hats and chaps. Now, frankly, it's a bit more village people than it is Marlboro men, but never mind, at least they're trying. And this American connection leads me to believe that something like this would really work in North America. I mean, we'll take a, a bus or a subway to a street circuit to watch Helio Castro Neves battle it out with Alonzo Fernandez, but will we drive out to a real racetrack like most Board of Road America? I don't think so. But for a racing like this, I drive a thousand miles. I'm Jim Kenzie. You are looking at a happy man. That is Fritz Kreutzpointer, the winner of this year's Truck Grand Prix here at the Nürburgring racetrack in Germany. And you know, Jim hit the nail on the head when he said, this series could be a big success in North America. Well, sources here have told me and officials that that could easily be a reality come 2002 and hopefully include a stop in Canada. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and trucks and the people who drive them. Well, it's a big, big car for the company, but it's really important for any company to have a real strong entry in the middle sedan market. And this uh, new uh, Altima was developed to be uh, just that. TSN's Motoring 2002 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas.